When I was invited to deliver a plenary at Slurf in the late 1980s, I decided to talk about what I have always considered one of the central issues in the field, age effects and maturational constraints. The research literature at the time presented a mixed picture. There was little agreement about the facts of the matter, and even less about explanations. Prominent scholars took a wide variety of positions, that there was a critical period for first language acquisition and also for second language acquisition, or for first language acquisition but not for second language acquisition, that the research showed children were better L2 learners than adults, or that adults were better than children, that a late start only affected pronunciation, or that it affected morphology and syntax too, that puberty was the turning point, or that there was no critical age, that affective factors, not biology, were causal, or that cognitive factors were, or that a combination of cognitive and affective factors were, or else that loss of access to UG was responsible, or L1 entrenchment, or input quantity, or input quality, and on and on. At Slurf, I presented a brief review of the literature on normal and abnormal first and second language populations. And it was that talk which formed the basis for the 1990 article in SSLA. I attempted to identify patterns by looking across findings from research on first language acquisition by feral children and in child abuse cases, on hearing children of deaf adults, on deaf children of hearing adults with no ASL producing home sign, and on deaf children and adults acquiring ASL. For second language acquisition, I looked at findings on younger children, older children, and adults learning a new language in the laboratory, at school, or naturalistically in the target language environment. There were a few surprises. I drew five main conclusions. First, the age at which sustained L2 exposure began, the age of onset, or AO, in part determines both rate of learning and ultimate level of attainment. Older children and adults show a rate advantage in the early stages of morphology and syntax, but this is only temporary. Faster in the early stages does not mean better, as shown by the long-term higher levels of proficiency achieved by younger children, and by the fact that only young starters can, not necessarily will, achieve native-like abilities. This was essentially what Steve Crash and Robin Scarcella and I had argued in our 1979 paper in TESOL Quarterly, and of the five conclusions, it was the best supported empirically. Second, rather than a single critical period for SLA, there are separate sensitive periods, during which the acquisition of different linguistic abilities is successful, and after which it is irregular and incomplete. To the best of my knowledge, Herb Seliger, back in 78, was the first person to suggest something similar. Sensitive period is a more appropriate term than critical period for a window of opportunity whose decline is less absolute and less abrupt than the sort observed in some animal learning. Third, the age-related losses in ability are cumulative, not a catastrophic one-time event, and are not limited to phonology. One linguistic domain is affected, and then another, as gradually became clear phonology, lexis, and collocations, and morphology and syntax in that order. As already noted, even among those who found the idea of maturational constraints on second language acquisition credible, some regarded their effects as limited to pronunciation. Fourth, the ability to achieve native-like phonological abilities in a second language begins to decline by age six in many individuals, not at puberty, as was widely believed at the time, and is impossible for anyone beginning after age 12, however motivated they may be and however much opportunity to learn they might have. Native-like morphology and syntax, on the other hand, seem possible for those who beginning by about age 15. Finally, affective input and general cognitive explanations for the reduced ability are inadequate. Constraints on the capacity for first and second language development reflect a progressive biologically scheduled decline in neuroplasticity, possibly associated with increasing myelination. Overall, the findings were consistent with the maturational state hypothesis. The first four conclusions have held up reasonably well since 1990. For recent reviews of research, see Gisela Graniena, 2016, in the inaugural issue of the Brill Journal, 
and my own chapter in a joint book in 2013. But I am less optimistic now than I was then about myelination as the relevant underlying neurophysiological change. Several of the conclusions seemed radical at the time, and given the limited L2 data, the hypothesized ages marking closure of the sensitive periods were certainly somewhat speculative. However, the basic idea of a series of sensitive periods extending beyond phenology rather than a single critical period has been supported by subsequent research findings, including those of a large-scale study of 65 Chinese immigrants to Spain by Gisela Graniena and myself in 2013 in Second Language Research, in which discontinuities and offsets were identified at roughly the predicted ages, different ages for the acquisition of phonology, lexis and collocations, and morphology and syntax, crucially within the same individuals. Second language acquisition exhibits statistically identifiable age-related discontinuities in ultimate attainment, not a general linear decline across the lifespan, as some have claimed based on notoriously unreliable census data. In general, however, some conclusions in the 1990 article may, if anything, have been overly conservative. For example, both Nicholas Abrahamson and Kenneth Hiltonstam in 2009 and Jürgen Meisel this year, 2018, have reported results implicating earlier offsets, perhaps as early as seven or eight for phonology and for at least some aspects of grammar. Meisel's findings and those of my colleague at the University of Maryland, Robert de Kaiser, further accentuate the need to move beyond broad brush statements about global sensitive periods for whole linguistic domains, and instead to examine age effects on features within domains, or even, I would add, classes of features, for example, perceptually non-salient, typologically marked, across domains. Occasional claims to have found exceptions to maturation constraints surface from time to time, but detailed reanalyses of those studies, for example, by Robert de Kaiser in 2006, by me in 2005 and 2013, usually show the ostensible counter-evidence to be the result of one or more of a variety of methodological limitations or flaws. That said, two German speakers among the 43 participants in Sonja van Boxtel's dissertation study in 2005, and one or two of the Dutch learners of English in the final study in the series of four by Theo Bongartz and colleagues are the nearest I have seen to exceptional cases. But even then, we are still only talking about native-like performance of isolated features on language-like tasks, nothing close to native-like L2 performance across the board. The article is widely cited, but I'm not sure how much of an influence it has had on the field. Some support remains for a no maturation constraints position, while among those who now accept the idea, disagreements continue about their scope, timing, and source. Right or wrong, however, I was confident then and am now that the issues are important for theory construction in SLA and for various social policy matters, and I still think they are among the most important. Consider theory construction first. As noted earlier, one of the more robust findings in research on SLA is the inverse relationship between age of first sustained exposure to a L2, or age of onset, and ultimate L2 attainment. The relationship is salient, widely attested, and widely, widely accepted by experts in the field, including even those who reject maturation constraints as its cause. As such, in the theory of theory change, developed by the American philosopher of science, Larry Loudon, in 77, 96, and elsewhere, age effects constitute what he calls a potential problem, a second language acquisition theory needs to explain. Once explained, they become what he calls a solved problem for the theory concerned, but, in his terms, an anomaly for theories that lack a viable explanation and a valuable metric in comparative theory evaluation. The significance of age effects is accentuated by related changes over time in the human capacity for incidental, especially instance learning. Relationships between implicit and explicit L2 knowledge independently constitute a major focus of SLA theory and research, but are also intimately bound up with learner age. It is generally accepted that young children acquire languages incidentally, and even as adults remain unaware of what they have learned that is, they develop implicit knowledge. 
adults, conversely, are held to rely increasingly on intentional learning and are aware of at least some of what they know. That is, they develop at least some explicit knowledge. Views about the relative importance of explicit learning vary. Some theorists claim that most adult language acquisition is explicit, some that very little of it is, and others that, while weaker than in young children, implicit learning remains the default option across the lifespan. I'm in that third category. Whichever position turns out to be correct, these issues linked to maturational constraints are important not just for SLA, but for cognitive science as a whole. Where social and educational policy is concerned, age effects and their explanations also have implications. For example, is there an optimal starting age for foreign languages in schools, or for bilingual, CLIL, or immersion programs? What forms of instruction are appropriate for immigrants, especially immigrant children of different ages? How do type and timing of instruction interact? Is learning of some linguistic abilities, phonology, lexis and collocations, morphology, syntax, pragmatics, or of some classes of target linguistic forms and form meaning relationships within domains, for example, irregular or perceptually non salient items, especially vulnerable to increasing learner age? What constitute reasonable explanation, expectations, as opposed to wishful thinking? for ultimate L2 attainment by adult learners whose occupation or aspiration for higher education requires advanced proficiency in a new language? And to what extent can relatively stronger aptitudes for implicit or explicit language learning compensate for a late start? The answer to the aptitudes question at least seems clear. Language aptitudes cannot overcome maturational constraints, but they can play a role within the bounds set by sensitive periods. For a detailed review of research findings on sensitive periods in general and relationships between age differences and language aptitudes in children and adults, I highly recommend the review by Gisela Graniena in the inaugural issue of Brill Research Perspectives in Multilingualism and Second Language Acquisition in 2016. In sum, age effects remain a fascinating issue in SLA, with several aspects unresolved. Scholars still disagree about maturational constraints but the increasing quantity and steadily improving quality of research are grounds for optimism. Certainly, solutions are a lot closer now than they were in 1990.